Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the COVID uh, from uh, the margins event, kindly hosted today by the Merkman Klein Center for Internet Society at Harvard University. Needless to say, we are extremely excited to be here with you today, celebrating what is a big accomplishment, a book, that has the ambition to be much more than simply a book in the library. So it is an editorial project, but really what it wants to do and what this session wants to achieve today is to actively inviting everyone, all attendees, all of us hit and variably hit and concerned understandably by the COVID pandemic to make room for another way of thinking and understanding and narrating the COVID uh, pandemic. One that takes as a frame of reference, the margins of society. So those of us that are typically out of, uh, you know, privilege, that are suffering the worst consequences of this crisis, which is, uh, or start the list as a health crisis, but very quickly became a social, economic, cultural and very personal crisis for us all. So my name is Stefania Milan and I am an associate professor on new media and digital culture at the University of Amsterdam in uh, the Netherlands. And what I would like to do, well, I'm one of the three editors of the book. You're about to meet uh, the others and to meet three amongst the 75 awesome authors that we marshal for this master uh, adventure. Uh, and uh, I'm one of the community builders that facilitated, if you want, this conversation on uh, COVID from the margins. As you can imagine, what we try to do here, it's uh, actually something that cannot be achieved by one person alone, nor by a group of 75 people, no matter how awesome. In fact, what we are just started, uh, starting is a conversation precisely by, as I said, making room for wearing different lenses, different colored lenses to see reality from uh, the point of view of those suffering from inequality, poverty, injustice, and discrimination. So what I'm gonna do before passing the baton, passing the word on to my co-editors and then to our, um, our authors that I'm gonna introduce in a minute, is to tell you something about the origins, or if you want the long journey of COVID from uh, the margins. So this uh, book project, which is by the way, also a blog, or I would say primarily a blog. So it was 2017, and you remember maybe those beautiful days in, we, in which we would have live meetings, live conversations, hugging people and sharing drinks in the sun. It was Cartagena de Indias in Colombia and Emiliano Trere from Cardiff University, whom you're going to meet in a minute, and myself were invited to organize an event in the outskirts of the, Inter uh, of the International Association of Media and Communication Research, so an academic um, organization that gathers scholars of media and communication that you know, travels around the world or used to travel around the world to organize uh, big gatherings of uh, like-minded people uh, at an event in, uh, in Colombia. And we were invited to do something on big data. It was a very, very broad invitation. And what we decided to do was to, to, to create a, a very you know, cozy space, a workshop, a workshop that quickly took up a life of its own. And it was entitled Big Data from the South. And the South for us was a placeholder, was a metaphor, was a proxy for not only the geographical South, as in the global South, but also for a number of pockets of inequality and discrimination that resist and thrive, unfortunately, also in developed, on the so-called developed society. And that's where, how and where the adventure of big data from the South started. It was, uh, it's an academic, uh, you know, experimentation, if you want, which I have uh, has always been very mindful of trying to also adopt different language and try to keep accessibility of our discourse on the horizon, 
which is why we organize events, you know, academic, uh, special issues, journals, stuff like that. But also, we also have a very beautiful, very lively blog, which is deliberately multilingual. And multilingualism for us is very important because we think it's also good not only to make room for other ways of seeing the world and describing the world, which is what languages are, different culture, different mindsets, but also because we wanted to reproduce to some extent the level of uh, you know, uneasiness that people at the margins uh, feel and experience on a daily basis when, for example, we hold our conversation exclusively in English. But that was big data from the South. It kept on going on the background until the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic hit, we quickly realized that the way the pandemic was narrated was from a very, very insular point of view. I mean, first it was China, then it was Italy, and the three editors of the book, by the way, are Italians living abroad. So we noticed how, you know, of course you con you're concerned for your own community, but there's much more that did not show up. There was much more that was actively silenced, uh, in part because there were no data, just to give you a sense. When it comes to Africa, at the beginning of the pandemic, only two countries out of the 57 in the African continent had the ability to test for COVID. Therefore, of course, if you have no data, you have no problem. If you have no problem, you have no empathy. If you have no empathy, you have, for example, no aid, no vaccine that reach, I mean, no, Africa, right? So we decided to, turn, to create a sub blog called COVID from the margins, COVID-19, sorry, uh, from the margins. And the blog kept, uh, you know, kept, uh, got a life on its own, became very attended. We started publishing in many different idioms, uh, you know, even idioms that we don't speak like Chinese, for example, we're looking for, you know, uh, assist, like helpers uh, all over the place to help us to, to edit the material. And um, at some point we decided that there was so much richness there, so much, to stories and voices from the margins that we wanted to give it also a sort of, you know, memory uh, for. And that's how the book was, was born. It's uh, proudly open access, free to download. You can even order your free uh, printed copy while supplies last. And that's what we celebrate today. As I said, it's just the beginning of a conversation. It's by no means the end. We did cover, you know, wealth of different communities at the margins, also empowering them to write their story. But I mean, this is just the beginning of a conversation and no book project, no matter how thick, can actually cover it all. So we hope that you eventually decide to join us in this collective endeavor. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce who is with me today. Unfortunately, we cannot have all the 75 uh, authors uh, you know, with us. We are doing a lot of presentations and we always invite different people. And today with us, we have, and I invite them to turn on their camera so they can wave by you. We have Emiliano Trere, uh, one of the editors of the book from uh, Cardiff University. We have a second, the other editor of the book, Silvia Maziero, the University of Oslo. And then we have three of the authors. We have Diego Serna Aragon, it's going to take you uh, to uh, Peru. Um, Irene Poetranto, that is going to take you instead of to some part of Asia. And finally, uh, we have uh, Shiam uh, Krishna, uh, that is going to take us to India. We try to you know, maximize some of the diversity, although there's, of course, a lot more that uh, we can talk about. Without further ado, I invite Emiliano to uh, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And, uh, and thank you so much for, the, for providing the space for us to, to present this book to the Bergman Klein Center. I cannot imagine a better place to, to present this. So many themes that resonate with, with what is being done at the center. So part of the uh, um, of what we, we, we did with the book was also uh, envisioning some concepts, some conceptual tools that could somehow frame and that have been at the same time inspired by the contribution of the book uh, at, at the same time. So I'm going to talk briefly about, about two of them. And the first of them is, as you will see here, well, the concept of the margins. So when we, when we started to think about these sort of spin-off of our blog, 
the concept of the margin seemed like a, a really great, a great feat. So uh, we use the margin as I'm sorry, we use the margin as a kind of a shortcut to speak of complex dynamics of power inequality, <clears throat> because processes of asymmetrical access to material and symbolic resources shape differentiated and unequal access to the public sphere. I'm using here the word of somebody, uh, a friend, actually, and a, and a, and a scholar, um, a Colombian scholar, Clemencia Rodriguez, uh, that inspired us, uh, in this case, uh, to apply the concept of the margins to uh, think about data and to think about datification and the ways through which datification impacts communities on the ground. So we see the margins as a complex side of struggle where these challenges, the challenges of datification unfold in different ways from the mainstream, where particular data constellation, ecologies, territories, um, uh, original and unexpected territories might emerge and, and might thrive. The margins are able to convey for us and this is something that resonates, as I said before, with the contribution from the book, uh, with this idea of periphery, this idea of uh, stories that come from the periphery, that and 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 it's able to capture the significance, the resourcefulness, and the unexpectedness, which is for us pivotal uh, of these data-related practices. Uh, now, if you have the, like me, if you're lucky enough to have also the printed copy that Stefania was showing, you will know that uh, uh, in the book, uh, uh, the margins have become the margin at the, at the singular. But this was by no means something that we did at the conceptual level. This is just something that happened. So if you're lucky enough to have it, you have a, a kind of limited edition um, kind of paper copy of that, but uh, we want to use the margins because we want to maintain the plurality of it. So we think in margins in plural terms, just like we think in plural terms when we use Souths in our network, in our research initiative, and in our publication. Plural, uh, different South, not bounded to a, a kind of geographical conception of the global North or the global South, but uh, uh, as a, also a proxy for resistance. So we find and we can find multiple Souths also in the North. In this way, also the margins retain this plurality, this multiplicity. And the second, the second concept that we mobilize is that of data poverty. We find that many of the contribution to our, to our book and, and to our blog that exceed the one that we were able to capture, to frame within the book, uh, more than evoking ideas of data colonialism or that relying on that, which is by, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great concept that it's, uh, it's uh, for, for understanding some processes, but for understanding the ones in the book, many times uh, words as inequality and poverty were more used. And data poverty has to do with the very same existence of people on the map of concerns. Because this oversight occurs because the policymakers increasingly rely on calculated publics in order to make their decision and to allocate resources, in this case, healthcare and vaccines, as we are, say, as we are seeing now with the vaccine rollout. So uh, being datafied during COVID-19 uh, might be for many disempowered, marginalized groups, actually a conditio sine qua non, an essential requirement of survival and care. So for us, data and poverty, and for the contributors of the book, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful concept because it uh, requires situating any analysis of the impact of datafication in relation to specific contextual contingent harms that it might impose on people and communities on the ground. So it has that specific, powerful contextualization, context-specific nature, which we find that it's, uh, it's really something that is needed in critical data studies. And it's really something that 
we hope to have achieved with, the, uh, with our blog and, and with the COVID-19 from the margins book. So after these two uh, uh, powerful lenses to understand COVID-19 and the data fight society, I will pass the baton to the other co-editor, Silvia, in order to finish this and to, uh, and to proceed with this, with this presentation. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks very much, Emiliano. And I'll also proceed to um, uh, introduce the community to a third uh, theme in, in our book, which is that of the datification of anti-poverty programs. And I'm delighted to have today with us uh, um, uh, Irene, uh, Shiam, and Diego, whose contributions in different ways relate to this third theme, and especially Diego is going to tell us about uh, datified social protection in uh, Peru. Before I complete the theoretical um, overview of uh, our of our book, of the, of the themes that structure our book, I'd like to just complete our picture by giving you some data. And also this gives me the occasion to tell you after my short intro to data and process, we are gonna have a quick break for questions from you in the virtual audience to which we are really looking forward. And so about our book, uh, Stefania Emiliano have already given a strong theoretical introduction to what the book did. I'm gonna throw some numbers in. So we have a total of 47 contributions from a total of 75 authors, quite impressive per se, we would say, and we realized through the process of building this, this edited collection in five different languages. As Stefania said, not all languages that us free editors actually speak. There was quite an editorial effort here. And all I'm gonna do is just to put such numbers in the context of indeed producing this book. So producing this book as a decolonial process, very much by design. So we thought in a project that seeks to narrate the untold, the silenced stories of this pandemic, uh, such a project, a project had to be open access and accessible to all, and such a project had to be multilingual, as Stefania has powerfully illustrated. And so is the book that emerged from indeed uh, our blog. And so is uh, uh, indeed the ongoing project of the COVID-19 from the margins blog. So uh, very quickly on say the process. So it all started from a call for blog posts on our, on our blog um, in May 2020 very much seeking narration of the silenced stories of the pandemic. We, I must say, as the blog was conceived, we weren't really sure what we would have found in terms of such narrations globally. Uh, what came out of this, and I'm delighted to have three of our, again, authors illustrating a uh, part of such stories today, is a collection in five overarching themes that we found uh, very much as threads across the contributions in the book. Themes being uh, starting very much from the notion of counting in the pandemic and who is counted and who is not in the first pandemic of the datafied society. We then have a second theme uh, dealing with new uh, inequalities and vulnerabilities. For example, those that Shyam is gonna deal with today regarding gig workers in India. A third theme relating to datafied social policies that Diego is gonna expand on. And two more themes, one relating to technological reconfigurations and policy changes in the pandemic. And a final theme relating to solidarity networks that emerged in the pandemic situation. So as a final thread adding to data poverty and data at the margins that Emiliano introduced, very much a final theme here is what changed in terms of policy, okay? So in terms of social policies, a concept that we found really useful here is that of datification 
of social protection programs. So how social protection has changed in a deified society and how COVID-19 has determined the distribution of subsidies and the algorithmic identification of uh, people entitled to such, such, to such subsidies. Very often, and I know uh, Diego is gonna expand on that today, uh, in a asymmetrical way. So we found, and I, and I close here my short introduction, very much a notion of informational injustice here. How is subsidy distributed? How is information in possession of uh, governments and uh, entities distributing subsidies combined in order to determine who is entitled and who is not? I finish with this question, and this is where I close my short introduction with many thanks to you, virtual audience, and uh, yeah, and that's where we yield for a short question break before giving the word to our authors. Thank you very much, uh, Emiliano and Silvia, for providing so much so much food for thought in such a short uh, time. As you probably know, dear audience, Italians are known to speak way too much and way too fast. But in this case, I can assure you that it is, in fact, really enthusiasm. Uh, for the topic and this urge that we feel to make room for a different ways of understanding and narrating the pandemic. Do you have any uh, friends as um, you know our amazing uh, Robin uh, uh, who is helping here in the background uh, put also in the chat please submit your questions uh, through the Q&A tool. Do you have any uh, question uh, doubt is it all clear do you want to actually raise uh, some other concern as it relates to understanding the uh, pandemic from the perspective of uh, the margins. We are all ears. I don't see hands raised. Am I correct? Counting to three, if there's none, then uh, we uh, give the word to, you know, even more substance, uh, talking about uh, how exactly the pandemic uh, happened in, uh, in this uh, margin specifically that we are gonna look at as a placeholder and a metaphor for, in fact, many other margins that are described in the book, but also those that we could not include in the book. And, uh, you know, they still need to be, uh, to be told or they've been told elsewhere. So then uh, I don't see anyone coming forward. So I would like to ask uh, Diego to join us and take us to Peru. I mean, in this uh, pandemic days, any occasion for any trip is in my uh, you know, perspective really welcome, no matter how symbolic it is. Diego, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, Stefania. And thanks, Emiliano and Silvia for the opportunity. Let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk very briefly about uh, the case of Peru. And this um, is more like a commentary based on a previous research that I did with a couple of colleagues uh, on the data file system of social assistance that uh, exists in Peru. Uh, so, uh, so what happened in, in Peru uh, in, in the wake of the pandemic between March and May? Uh, so initially there was a big response uh, by the government uh, and they declared a national emergency of quarantine. Uh, but given the, the nature of the population in, in matters of labor, uh, a lot of people live in informal informality and uh, people live with and the, the, their daily earnings or weekly earnings. And so uh, decreeing a national emergency uh, meant that some people didn't have money for uh, go by in, in their normal life. So uh, this of course was noticed by the government and they, they tried to address this by uh, giving a subsidy, but this subsidy was not universal. They used, uh, 
the household targeting system or CISFO in Spanish uh, to give this subsidy to what they define as vulnerable uh, population. And, and of course, the, the debate in, in media uh, was mainly uh, concerned with what means to be vulnerable, right, in Peru. And they, uh, it, it, they mainly concentrate on the economic definition of what means being vulnerable. And, but the, the thing is that there was a, a, a deeper problem with using this type of system. And the thing is that the, the system was designed for social welfare program and specifically for uh, a logic of uh, making public spending more, more efficient. So uh, the, the logic, there was an on the map logic for people requesting being uh, up for being included in these social welfare programs. It's not like everyone had, has the data updated regularly. So they, there was a, 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 of course, there was a great problem with the quality of data that was available in, in this database. Uh, and of course, as you may imagine, the, by the moment of the emergency that there was a poor data and there, it was not updated. So the consequence of this was that the money did not reach uh, the people that was in need, right? So there was, an, there, among multiple consequences, there was a max exodus of people leaving the cities because they didn't have the money enough to sustain themselves. And there were subsequent modifications uh, about to the subsidies, but they were never really actually universal. That was some of the demands of some activists and other parties. So as you may see, uh, there were mobilizations uh, across the country, people living in the cities, people saying, we, can, we, we have to leave the cities because we don't, we don't have any money. We, we have been inside our houses for, uh, for a number of weeks and we have to put in our savings and now we don't have any more money to live with. So a couple of lessons uh, uh, that I think we can learn from, from this uh, terrible experience. Uh, the first one is, uh, what, what are the consequences of addressing a public health crisis as COVID was, a social crisis as, co as COVID was, using technologies devices for probably alleviating programs that have this logic of, we are trying to make public spending the more efficient uh, possible is that uh, these targeting technologies are designed not to give money to everyone, but they are designed to restrain the spending, just exactly the opposite of what you want to do in this kind of emergency. And they want to filter people out of the benefits that the government gives to people. So, uh, and they also rely on precarious practices of information collection that are uh, like endemic in, in countries with a precarious state. So by definition, I think these technologies render, render people invisible. They, they are not designed for this kind of uh, emergency that they were used for, instead of like giving universal uh, subsidies as some people suggested. And the second lesson that I, that I want to touch upon is about being visible in the South. So ma many times in data studies, we hear concerns about uh, privacy and surveillance, and those are, of course, justified. They are really important topics. But uh, in the South, we also have this concern about data poverty that uh, Stefania and Emiliano touched upon previously, and they also wrote a, an article on it. Uh, that is that we have this concern about our data not being good enough for assisting people in need, and that sometimes actually being visible to the state is a privilege for, for some people. And that's also some people, other people don't have that privilege and they suffer the consequence for it. So, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. I will pass the button to the next presenter. 
Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Irene Potranto. I'm a senior researcher with the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. Thank you uh, to Stefania, uh, Silvia and Emiliano for inviting me to be here today and also to contribute to the book, of course. And thank you to the Berkman Center for hosting this event. Um, I will uh, share a few highlights and, and lessons uh, from uh, writing this chapter, uh, looking at the COVID-19 impact and its uh, COVID-19's impact on marginalized communities in four countries, Singapore, for South Korea, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Um, so um, in the article, uh, my co-author Justin Lau and I, we discussed the effects of different governments' COVID-19 measures. In particular, we looked at uh, its impact on migrant workers in Singapore, the LGBTIQ community in South Korea, in Seoul specifically, and uh, on rural and indigenous peoples in Indonesia and the Philippines. Um, and we chose these four countries because we thought it'd be a nice contrast, uh, you know, showing the stark differences uh, between between two countries that are known to be developed in Asia, which are Singapore and South Korea, um, versus countries that are uh, perhaps uh, known to be less developed, such as Indonesia and the Philippines. And so by contrasting these uh, two sets of countries, we thought that it would be um, interesting you know, to shed light on the impact of different measures that governments have pursued to curb COVID-19. So I'll just share a few highlights here. Um, so in terms of uh, our findings from Singapore and South Korea, so as you may know, Singapore and South Korea are, you know, uh, they're, they're tech savvy countries. They're highly uh, connected to the internet, um, have very high internet and smartphone penetration. And so it's of no surprise that they use a lot of digital tools when it comes to combating COVID-19 in, in their countries. Um, so in Singapore we and South Korea, we saw both governments deploying things such as uh, apps, uh, so digital contact tracing apps. Uh, Singapore even used uh, Boston Dynamics as robot dogs to patrol parks to ensure that people are physical distancing. And uh, South Korea became famous for using a variety of tools to facilitate contact tracing from using CCTV surveillance footage to using cell phone uh, location data. Uh, even to people's credit card purchases. Um, and Singapore has also issued wearable devices for seniors, for example, to help facilitate contact tracing. However, from our research, we found that a lot of these um, techno solutions, right, all of these fancy tools that both governments rolled out uh, to help combat COVID-19, really uh, was, uh, they were not inclusive. Um, in Singapore, so at around the beginning of March, they reported zero deaths, and I think only around about 200 COVID-19 cases. Um, but then, you know, soon after, around early May, uh, they reported 23,000 COVID cases, 90% percent of which were linked to migrant workers who were living in crowded dormitories. Um, so migrant workers have been really crucial to Singapore's economy. Um, and because they don't make a, a lot of money, at least not in comparison to what, you know, the typical white collar Singaporean workers make, um, they often live, you know, like 20 people in an apartment sharing only one bathroom, which of course makes, um, you know, uh, proper health and sanitation procedures impossible or, and physical distancing also impossible. And furthermore, uh, migrant workers uh, don't typically own uh, the latest smartphones, you know, for, for the contact tracing apps uh, to work. And migrant workers have uh, just generally been largely ignored by the Singaporean government. Um, and so it was no surprise that they were treated as an afterthought in the government's uh, COVID-19 um, strategies. And of course, it resulted in this huge spike of cases um, in early May. Um, in South Korea, in contrast, and so uh, there, there was a huge cluster of COVID-19 outbreak that occurred in a district, an, an entertainment district called Taiwan in Seoul, so South Korea. Um, and that uh, district, that, that uh, area of the city is also popular with the LGBTIQ community. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, South Korea has very sophisticated contact tracing 
strategies, but they also, at least at the beginning of the pandemic, excessively disclosed uh, people's information, personal information when they when they're reporting an outbreak. And as a result, you know, you have people who um, already fear the stigma emanating from, you know, catching COVID-19 or being suspected of having COVID-19, but also the stigma associated with being uh, part of the LGBTIQ community in a, you know, generally conservative country uh, such as Korea, uh, South Korea. And so what I ended up happening was when news of this Taiwan cluster of COVID-19 cases broke out, uh, we saw uh, an increase in online attacks and offline harassment as well against LGBTIQ persons. Uh, and these people ended up being blamed for the pandemic as well. And eventually the South Korean government learned to scale back the amount of personal information that are disclosed to the public when it comes to reporting um, cases, but that was a tough lesson uh, to learn and uh, severely impacted those in the LGBTIQ community in Seoul. Um, in contrast, we looked also at Indonesia and the Philippines, and what we are seeing there is that the impact of COVID-19 is really uh, even more pronounced when it comes to marginalized communities, remote communities, uh, because they already have inadequate health services, they don't have running water and all the basic necessities uh, to live that are fundamental uh, to, to our human rights. Uh, mine sites in particular, mining sites, uh, they've become, uh, they became a factor for the spread of COVID-19 with the risk of infecting uh, local communities and indigenous peoples with very small population. And so they're already vulnerable to extinction. Um, and when you, uh, you know, add COVID-19 on top of that, you know, it becomes really dangerous for, for these uh, really rural communities. So I'll give two examples. So in Indonesia, we looked at uh, the US owned Grasberg mine. So the Grasberg mine is owned by the American company Freeport. It is the largest copper and gold mine in the world. And they really waited a long time before they suspend services before they suspend mining operations uh, when the COVID-19 outbreak began. Um, as a result, there was a cluster of, of about 150 cases in mid-May. And if you can imagine, the Papua region is about double the size of Great Britain with 4 million people, and yet they only have five hospitals designated to treat COVID patients and only two isolation rooms that meet the WHO standards. And so people, uh, the, the, those who are living in local communities were really concerned that uh, Freeport wasn't suspending operations in the Grasberg mine because obviously it's a really profitable, profitable mine uh, in the midst of a global pandemic. And then finally, we looked at an area, an island called Homonhon Island in the Philippines, uh, where there is a, a mining site uh, to mine chromite ore. And even though the local authorities there had imposed a COVID-19 lockdown, the government still allowed a China bound ship to, to dock there in order to, to pick up some shipment of chromite ore. Um, and this is a concern because Homon on Highland uh, has no health facility, no sea ambulance, and no functioning community uh, hospital. And so if the community was infected by COVID-19, um, it would decimate uh, the, the local populations. Um, and what we are seeing in, in both cases in Indonesia and the Philippines is that um, you know, even though the local uh, community really try to, to protect themselves from you know, outside uh, transmission of COVID-19. So they impose uh, lockdown. Um, you know, government still allowed all these operations to take place, uh, overriding the local community's wishes, overriding even national lockdowns that were in place, all in the name of um, allowing mining operations to take place. And in fact, they even disperse uh, protests uh, against these mining operations uh, using COVID-19 lockdown down as an excuse, you know, the irony there. And so just to conclude, um, you know, I think we all are aware here that uh, the fight for COVID-19 must be conducted in a transparent and rights respecting manner and in ways that are inclusive of local communities, because even though we are all impacted by COVID-19 today, we are not impacted by COVID-19 equally. So I will end there um, and uh, I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, uh, I'm Shyam Krishna, and uh, I'm a uh, doctoral candidate at the uh, uh, Royal Holloway uh, University of London, and I'll be talking about the experience of food delivery workers uh, during the pandemic in India. Uh, this comes from uh, my qualitative research interviews and observations done due in the coastal city of Chennai in South India. Uh, this was done just 
at the start of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, I engage with food delivery workers who depend on uh, apps like uh, Zomato, Swiggy, and uh, Uber Eats for uh, people not, you know, aware of India. These are the Deliveroo uh, and uh, in, uh, Deliveroo-like apps that are uh, available in India. And uh, I also undertook an auto ethnography working as a part-time food delivery worker. I signed up to two of these apps uh, and uh, to directly experience the algorithmic and data, uh, data elements, which were uh, possibly difficult to observe in any other way. In the last few days of my work as a food delivery worker, I had the opportunity to see how the pandemic response was shaping up. Uh, and use that as a, a starting point to have a follow-up conversation with uh, some of my interview contacts and uh, to understand how platform tactics were shaped and the treatment of workers kind of materials uh, materialized as the uh, pandemic uh, you know, bore on. Uh, these issues that I detail here have been highlighted uh, broadly by the workers themselves in multiple cities and uh, during protests. Uh, what you see in the photo is uh, a protest in Chennai. Okay, uh, research has already shown that for gig workers, as platform workers are called, the uh, you know broadly food delivery workers and uh, cab drivers that uh, uh, that are based on app-based uh, ordering of services by customers uh, are called gig workers. In this case, food delivery workers, we know that research says things have not been good even before 2020, and 2020 just brought on more. Uh, more of a problem for them. Uh, the pre-pandemic uh, gig worker already had to contend with physical risk, such as navigating heavy traffic on uh, road or facing unfair income levels on their daily uh, uh, daily work uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, but as soon as the pandemic set in, what we saw was a plan uh, was that the platforms actively shifted the additional health risk uh, of sanitation and social distancing that we all expect. Uh, as part of the pandemic uh, uh, daily living to the workers. So this, this became not only an uh, uh, issue of health for them, but also became an issue of uh, financial liability because uh, when, when the platforms uh, uh, assured the so-called contactless deliveries, it is the workers at the front-facing uh, uh, entity of the platform who have to make sure that that assurance is brought to fore. This assurance of safety was given to the customer uh, so they can continue to buy from these platforms, right? The safety but comes at a price uh, where the worker, uh, where the worker uh, had to put in additional time and effort just to be able to uh, make sure that the uh, customer is happy just as they were before the pandemic. For instance, the platform promises what is called safe packaging. Uh, it is the worker that they need uh, that needs to make sure that the restaurant complies with that safe packaging, even though it is a it is made as a uh, uh, promise by the platform. And this uh, this comes with it under unpaid uh, uh, labor and even actual physical packing of these uh, uh, packages by the workers. In one case, I did the packing, as you can see in the uh, photo. Uh, on top of this, masks and gloves, uh, as it became uh, normal during the pandemic, landed as a responsibility for the worker. Uh, the, the platforms did not necessarily continue to support it as we would expect. The workers during all this also had to undergo uh, what is essentially biopolitical and algorithmic surveillance. Uh, everything from their body temperature was uh, displayed on the app. Uh, they were asked to uh, undergo a process oriented check of whether they were considered safe in how they handle their food even though their own safety was not assured in any other way uh, during that process. And uh, with the pandemic conditions supposed to go on for probably at least a couple of years more, uh, this unpaid labor and the deepening of the surveillance that we see is set to become the new normal. So challenging this at this point becomes quite uh, uh, important. And uh, the, pla the platforms, as we see, already have a very tenuous relationship with the workers. Uh, they are already cast as not as employees, and they consider self-employed partners. But uh, I consider the platform in the pandemic also to have what is essentially a Jekyll and Hyde problem. They seek to occupy both the role of being a disruptive mar market innovator, where they are 
uh, fast moving software uh, entrepreneurial ventures they want to respond to the market's needs but they also seek to emulate a benevolent charity by seeking donations to support their non employee workers uh, so it is a very uh, uh, interesting uh, space that they want to occupy for instance the major players in uh, chennai uh, in food delivery responded quickly to the market need by introducing grocery delivery for their customers again this meant that uh, the workers themselves had to queue up longer or pack la larger consignments for the uh, customers but without any assurance of equivalent and the fair increase in wage for their extra effort uh, and uh, equivalently the platform also tried to be uh, you know play a more benevolent role at least uh, as a pr uh, notion where they sought by aggressive marketing donations from the customers themselves for the worker because the workers in you know by their own statements were in getting paid enough even though ironically the not getting paid was because of the uh, platforms the platforms continued to position the workers as heroes and saviors uh, because they provide essential services of groceries you know during the pandemic but uh, when when the donations landed it was the platforms which decide on which workers get funded so there was still some sort of control and power relationship that was maintained there the workers themselves felt that these tactics uh, only ensure the commercial future of the platform and not the individual workers themselves so clearly this is a place very ripe for regulation uh, while there are social safety nets uh, that are in discussion none of them actually break into this idea that the that the platforms can occupy a space where they say we we are going to provide labor but we are not employees employers right so they they kind of abdicate the responsibility to uh, to majorly the workers uh, who do unpaid labor and invisible labor uh, to keep the customers happy but they still aren't able to claim the rightful level of uh, 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 level of wage that they are they are uh, uh, supposed to get and this is getting worse during the pandemic because what was once only restricted to informal employer employee relationship that you would find in a place like india now is becoming digitized and aggregated uh, as the pandemic moves on so routine surveillance and uh, the the kind of the reporting of the health uh, checks of the uh, the riders the workers will be datafied and then become part of their algorithmic profile for the future so that is kind of the normal that uh, the pandemic is pushing through for these workers and um, that's basically what i have and uh, uh, you can find more in my recent paper if you're interested happy to talk through so thank you oh. so much to all uh, the presenters in particular the authors that this uh, that agreed kindly to join uh, us today because uh, you know if you edit a book uh, it's a book of stories and it's always much better to have the people who experience or research the stories directly to have a say i would like now to invite all of the speakers who join us today to come forward and um unmute themselves and uh, especially put the camera on thank you so much and um, it's time for Q&A. We have 10 minutes to sort it out and make the world a better place. So here's your chance to ask questions to these wonderful uh, people. I see there's one by Catherine. Uh, do you want Catherine to speak? Probably you can actually not do that. Sorry, I'm confused about, I've been in too many meetings today. It's already uh, evening here in Europe. Uh, so Catherine um, congratulates us on the wonderful effort. Thank you very much. It's much appreciated. And she reminds us that Clemencia Rodriguez offers the idea of citizen media network. I remember you uh, or those who might have missed it. That Clemencia Rodriguez was quoted by Emiliano as one of the inspiring voices uh, on uh, you know, our choice essentially to, uh, to go for the margins as a frame of reference, as a flexible, you know, very spacious, if you want, frame of reference. And, uh, but Clemencia reminds us, Catherine, uh, as an expression, so um, the, she, she contributes the idea of season media as an expression of counter media, so resistance, right? So she asked to our speakers, did you find examples of data creativity or data resistance alongside data poverty in the cases you shared? Now, uh, before uh, giving the, the word to anyone, uh, you know, the three speakers who want to say something, I'd say that there is an entire session in the book that explores that. In fact, it's the biggest part of the book. 
because precisely because uh, there's a lot of uh, you know untold sad stories of the margins that need to be you know brought to the surface but there's also an amazing creativity and solidarity and resistance that emerges also in the fringes of uh, society and that allows actually all these people to thrive and survive uh, no matter what happens so um anyone wants to contribute an example for Catherine? I can actually. Please, Sylvia. Yes, it's just referring to section five of our work that, as Stefania rightly mentions, um, uh, relates directly to examples of solidarity and resistance in the pandemic. I think we can tap on many. So, for example, we have uh, a case from Argentina in the section five that details solidarity networks built through uh, instant messaging in order to fill the institutional voids. So in order to cater those, to, for example, to those households in poverty that uh, are not reached by the social protection schemes uh, uh, that Diego talked about with the re reference to um, uh, Peru. So that's one case. And we also, uh, we also can't forget that the pandemic unfolded at the same time as uh, part of the um, Black Lives Matter movement, of course, in June 2020. And we do have several examples also in the blog of resistance enactment through the social media during the Black Lives Matter, um, Matter movement that overlapped directly with the oppressions witnessed during COVID-19. So I think all I wanted to say is that the book is a... Uh, collection of stories of invisibility, but also a collection of stories of resistance. And uh, uh, I think the section that uh, Stefania mentioned, the section five, is a big indicator that is the thickest, and it's a big indicator of hope. So that's my sort of reaction to Catherine's uh, uh, comment. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm looking whether everyone else, anyone else wants to add something. I can't I'm looking at the book to be reminded, yeah. in fact, of all the many, uh, the many stories that we have here, uh, Emiliano. Yeah, no, just just to say, I mean, you have said it. Uh, thanks, Catherine, for for your words. Coming from you, it's really, it's really satisfying. And uh, there are like two dynamics that uh, Stefania and Silvia already kind of highlighted, and it's always, I think. Resistance is connaturated is in, 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 in every kind of uh, uh, um, dynamic that we, that we have seen our authors document so many ways of resisting this. It's kind of uh, uh, with, uh, you know, from the margins. But at the same time, the creation of solidarity so points to the alternative uses of technology and data for other kind of aims, for other kind of needs, uh, for other kind of uh, words that we that they want and we want to inhabit. So I think that this point really resonate with Clementia's citizen media uh, uh, research. You know the way her research in Colombia and uh, can connect to other parts of the world is just is just amazing, and 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 the way it can resonate with many contexts. So. In a way, it's a book about multiple contexts, but uh, uh, but it's also a book about uh, about diversity, but also connections through all these diverse contexts. So contextualization uh, doesn't need to be uh, fragmentation. It can be uh, um, some kind of pl rich plurality of uh, pluriversal uh, reality, as we call it, using uh, Arturo Escobar lens so yeah i think that the reference to clementia is also really appropriate to talk about resistance and alternative forms of solidarity creativity and different appropriation of data yeah thank you thank you very much and i would like actually to add a, a, a little uh you know add on literally to the issue of resistance and thinking also what can academia do you know, to contribute, not only to voice and give space and make room to, for thinking and broadcasting resistance as we have done 
in this book, but also try to you know, uh, implement it ourselves in a way, try to resist and contribute to ongoing efforts from the space of privilege or you know, variably privileged space that we occupy in academia. And I do so actually with a great example, which is probably the most creative and the most unexpected in the book, which comes from a group of astronomers, people studying stars in Brazil. And it's a, it's a um, contribution co-authored by, I'm counting on the fly, but I think like seven or eight different people, not all of them in academia. And they tell the story of how, you know, there was a group of astronomers in, uh, uh, in an area of, of uh, Brazil, in the village of Aldeia Verde in Brazil, uh, where uh, that were supposed to, you know, they were there prior to the pandemic to study the stars or whatever astronomers uh, do, you know, we have media studies, uh, the scholars, we don't actually get that, but we're certainly very fascinated and very respectful of their work. And um, then the pandemic hit. And they realized that what they were doing was in fact so partial and so marginal in a way in the grand scheme of things that they actually redirected, changed some of the destination of the funds that uh, were made available to them to work with local communities, in particular local indigenous communities to, uh, you know, um, as they say, to use astronomy as a tool to face COVID-19 induced isolation in the indigenous village of Aldeia Verde in Brazil. So there's probably a lot that we can do, but we hope that this example is a great, uh, of great inspiration, not only you know, for our, all of us doing humanities and social sciences, but also for those that maybe are in, uh, in different uh, disciplines, but nonetheless uh, can contribute from, you know, the position of privilege that often academia occupies without, of course, um, you know, forgetting that there are also many academics that are not privileged. But, you know, in general, people who have uh, the luxury of studying the social reality are, you know, way or another relatively privileged. So I see that we are actually getting uh, to 7 p.m. here in Amsterdam and 1 p.m. Uh, in Boston. So um, I don't know whether if there is any other question or any other, uh, you know, input that comes from Irene, Shia, uh, Diego. Um, just to kind of add on, you know, as uh, kind of the academic response is also looking, you know, uh, as you mentioned in the example of astronomy, I think broadly media and communications or critical data studies, or in my case, management information systems, right? So we are looking too, too much into one set of users sometimes. So much like the astronomy uh, issue, there are quite a lot of data adjacencies that kind of are thrown up in a situation like pa pandemic that we are not aware of. So, uh, or rather we don't think in the research process. One thing that came up uh, uh, on how solidarity is built up is um, the people who are packing the, uh, the managers uh, or the, the workers in the ales of uh, grocery shops are now responding to how gig workers who deliver those at, at every level. And that's not being captured in some of the many of the conversations that we have. So the pandemic has actually brought that solidarity on. So it will be interesting to see how this kind of changes. And on this very enlightening uh, comment, but especially you know reason to to hope uh, and keep dreaming uh, for uh, you know in, uh, of, of a better world, even in pandemic times. I guess uh, we. Uh, bring this uh, session uh, to a close. Once again, I would really like to thank our speakers, the, the authors and, and the editors, but especially the, uh, our host for today, the Berkham Klein Center for Internet and uh, Society at Bar Artwork University for having us. We encourage you to download the book, distribute, share it. That's what this book is for. And please consider contributing to the ongoing conversation on uh, the blog, from whatever corner you want to write and in whatever idiom uh, you want to express uh, yourself. Thank you so much for being uh, with us. And I wish you, uh, whatever you are, a good afternoon, good morning, or good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.